Okay, so uh, we're going to get started. So I am Tom Coughlin. I'm Jim Handy, and thanks you all for showing up. It's a good crowd. Because we are going to talk about an update on emerging memories and uh, what a difference a year make, uh, makes. Last year we wrote a report and we were talking about uh, the long and, winding, long and winding road to emerging memories. But this year, our, our report is called Emerging Memories, Emerging Memories Ramp Up. So therefore, a long and winding road has become a ramp. Um, so a year has made a fair, fair amount of difference. It looks like there's actually some traction on here rather than the, the long suffering uh, uh, folks developing uh, all these new memory technologies. There actually seems to be a, a great deal more applications in use. So we're going to talk today about uh, an update on uh, different types of these uh, new memory uh, all the non-volatile memory technologies. Um, we'll look at uh, some of the things needed to support and make these things really happen, some of which you heard uh, actually earlier today, particularly in this session and, uh, and in the morning as well. And finally, some, some hurdles and some outlooks with regard to uh, actual how much stuff is going to get shipped and how much capital equipment it's going to take to make some of that happen. So uh, with that, uh, Jim's going to talk about emerging memory update by type. Okay, thanks, Tom. And so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about different emerging memory types. Actually, first I'm going to talk about the PCM and Crosspoint, and then Tom's going to take over from the MRAM area. But this is a picture that, uh, of, of a model that Intel put out in 2015 at the Intel Developer Forum of 3D Crosspoint. It was about, you know, whatever, a meter high, and it was made out of wood. And so, you know, a lot of people were asking at that time, what is, what is Crosspoint made out of? Is it PCM? And I said, no, it's wood. You know, didn't you see the model? <laughs> anyway, this, this was a really cool looking wooden model. Unfortunately, my camera didn't do a really good job of capturing the color, but it you know, gives a good idea. And um, the, the big deal about this, the reason why there is so much persistent memory work going on right now is because this fits into the memory storage hierarchy. Um, how many of you have already seen this chart and had it explained to you? So about half. So I'm going to make you guys put up with it again <laughs> while I describe it to the rest of the group. This, this is a chart that just explains what it takes to fit into the memory storage hierarchy. And what you've got is on the horizontal axis is price per gigabyte in orders of magnitude. And you've got uh, on the vertical axis bandwidth in orders of magnitude. And this is all rough approximations of stuff. You know, if you really were to take me to task, I'd say, well, you know, what's the bandwidth of an SSD? Well, that depends. Um, so I've got these big fuzzy orbs in there. And, you know, years ago, I was showing this thing and showing that the reason why SSDs fit in is because their cost has reached a point where it makes sense to go into this memory storage hierarchy. Uh, NAND flash used to have a much higher price over here near DRAM or even higher than DRAM. And it just didn't fit into this line. 3D Crosspoint now fits into the line because there is a gap that can be filled between DRAM and NAND flash. And as long as 3D Crosspoint costs the right thing, then you know what its speed's going to be because physics determines that. And the cost is something that is a business issue. Um, this business issue has been kind of difficult for Intel, although they had planned for it. It still ends up you know, being something that looks kind of weird. Uh, this is a bunch of NAND flash manufacturers, and you know some of them also make DRAM and that kind of stuff. And this is what their profits, percent profits were during the past several quarters. Um, what the takeaway is from this is that the non-volatile solutions group out of Intel is the one that is making uh, 3D Crosspoint as well as NAND flash SSDs. And all these other guys here are making NAND flash SSDs too. They've all been profitable either on the NAND flash or some of them make DRAM on the DRAM. But Intel has almost consistently made a loss. There are only two quarters where they didn't lose money in this. And that was during a time when prices were very high for DRAM. Now you remember that last chart, the price has to be lower than DRAMs. Well, when DRAM prices are just extremely high, which they were in 2018, then um, the price of 3D Crosspoint can be a lot higher than it can be when DRAM prices are depressed. And so Intel was able to make a profit in you know, the end of 2018. But as soon as the DRAM prices collapsed, they had to keep pace with their cross point prices. And that ended up pushing them back into losing territory. Some people ask, 
why does Micron not ship their Quantix products, which are also based on 3D cross-point memory? And the reason why is because Micron's small enough compared to Intel that this would be a horrible mess for them. And also, they don't have processors that they can use to offset the uh, price. That for every Optane product that Intel is looking forward to selling in the future, they're going to be able to sell a Cascade-like uh, server processor. And that's going to more than offset the cost. So, you know, it makes sense for Intel to lose money on this. But it doesn't make sense for Micron. Um, the, you know, the thing that really caused uh, 3D Crosspoint's price to go down is the fact that we have had this huge price per gigabyte drop for DRAM. This is just, uh, I think it's through June, of uh, price per gigabyte for DRAM and what it's done. And we saw a 59% decrease from then. It's actually gone down by about 63% recently. And so what is the status with this is that uh, Optane SSDs are gaining modest acceptance. The reason why is the NVMe interface is too slow to really take advantage of all of the speed that's available to 3D crosspoint memory. An Optane SSD is only six to eight times as fast in IOPS as um, a NAND flash SSD. However, the latency is really good for these things. So if you have an application where latency is everything and IOPS are not such a bad you know, problem, then buying an Optane SSD is a really good idea. But there are a lot of other applications where you know, people don't really see the value of paying that much for an SSD that's got 3D crosspoint in it. And meanwhile, the NAND flash manufacturers are countering by trying to develop very high-speed NAND SSDs. We're probably going to see a new wave of NAND flash SSDs really come into the market next year. Optane DIMMs we expect to be the biggest seller um, once they really get traction and get into the marketplace for the next generation CPUs. And I just had to say, I've got a report on this that is now available that uh, talks about 3D Crosspoint and where it's going in there. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Tom. Thank you, Jim. So uh, let's go into uh, detail on, uh, besides the phase change memory, uh, 3D Crosspoint, let's look at some of the other memory technology, uh, these non-volatile memory technologies that are out there. Uh, we'll start with MRAM. Uh, so uh, there's a few different flavors of magnetic random access memory that are out in the field. Um, the uh, Everspin is a, a company that's been making discrete devices. They've been selling a lot of this, what's called toggle mode uh, MRAM, which, which requires uh, field reversed uh, MRAM technology. Um, there's an awful, uh, actually altogether, uh, they have sold something like 123 million uh, discrete uh, devices. A lot, most of these are toggle, and there's going to need to be a few of the uh, the newer model of the spin t uh, spin tunnel torque. Um, but they're used for caches and buffers, and that's been a lot of the application. A little bit of memory that's uh, very fast, it's non volatile, but aided in a lot of different applications. Um, the spin transfer torque uh, is a faster technology. Um, it actually uh, uses uh, quantum mechanical properties to cause the uh, uh, a change uh, in from the high high resistance state to a low resistance state. However, there is a and it's a, it shows a lot of promise in terms of the technology on the discrete side. In fact, uh, Everspin uh, is now uh, ship starting to ship uh, one gigabit uh, parts uh, with promise of a potential future there. Um, and uh, but there is one issue with the in spin tunnel torque is going to have many years of development and and uh, we believe is going to be. Uh, very important for this industry. However, there's one issue with spin tunnel torque uh, that I did want to mention is that because of the peculiarities of the way that uh, spins react, uh, uh, the way that the reversal happens, you're depending upon some thermodynamic, which are kind of random events to occur in order to be able to get this torque developed with this technology. And so there's a, there's a, uh, a little bit of a latency there, which, uh, which uh, latency and, and performance, uh, which, is re which is due to that. And the reason why that's important is there's another technology that the magnetic random access folks are, are in the laboratory basically right now. They call it spin orbit torque. And the advantage here is it, it, uh, it avoids that, uh, you know, uh, thermodynamic fluctuations that then I can ca that I could, uh, cause torque on the spins and change the magnetic state in the materials. In this case, uh, they can avoid that and uh, therefore this uh, holds promise uh, on the demonstrations people have done to be a uh, very high performance non-volatile memory technology um, and actually uh, uh, much faster than spin tunnel torque uh, a little bit larger uh, than the spin tunnel torque devices but uh, uh, smaller than SRAM and with speeds that are believed that will be comparable to SRAM 
in fact, even the, the, the higher speed SRAM, which oftentimes have more, more transistors. Um, so the, the current status of MRAM right now, I mentioned before, there's a company called Everspin. Uh, uh, examples uh, of some uh, technologies, uh, MRAM cache is used in IBM SSDs. There's also some RAID controllers that are using, uh, using MRAM cache in them. Um, as I said before, they shipped a, Everspin has shipped something about 123 million of these discrete devices for various applications. There's a company, actually a startup in the area here called Spin Memory, formerly known as Spin Torque Technologies. Um, and they've uh, launched uh, their own, uh, and they're basically selling IP for making, uh, for making a, 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 this MRAM, a processional spin current device, and also what they call their endurance engine technologies. Uh, all the major foundries are sampling magnetic random access devices right now um, and offering that. Um, there are two that have actually shipped some products. Uh, Everspin is still sole supplier of these uh, standalone MRAMs. Uh, another startup company called Avalanche is, is also sampling. You know, we forgot to put something in there, and that is that Everspin also has a DIM that's got MRAM on it. Oh, it's, that's true. Yes, they do. It's expensive, but, you know, if you wanted to have something to try out uh, MRAM, you could just buy their DDR4, or is it DDR3? I don't remember. Uh, I think it's 4. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. they, they could use the speed. Um, uh, today's markets, uh, especially for the discrete devices, space, uh, high uptime systems where you, you know, you want to have power saving capabilities, like turn on, I'm instantly there, uh, caches and buffers. But uh, um, as we get in here, there's, uh, there's a lot of promise. And actually, it's going to, what we believe is really going to be driving the volume of MRAM technology is its incorporation into embedded devices. In particular, um, some of the things that are going to drive this are IoT applications, and in particular, if they include uh, uh, AI type functions, artificial intelligence type functions, uh, particularly something called an inference engine, which can run an artificial intelligence uh, program pre trained but on a, uh, say, a mobile or a device or an edge device out in the field. Um, but we believe that MRAM uh, will shrink past the capabilities of SRAM and Flash uh, has that capability. Um, in particular, we're talking about NOR Flash here, uh, which is often used in some of these applications. It can be tuned to applications. Um, if there's trade-offs between retention, endurance, and capacity, the cell retention, um, it, the endurance, uh, capacity, and, and temperature fits in there as well. There's even people talking about them for some of these uh, embedded uh, uh, automobile applications and uh, able to uh, work going on to withstand reflow uh, solder temperatures. Um, also, uh, uh, one or two transistor MRAM devices, which is kind of where they're looking at right now between the spin tunnel torque and the spin, spin orbit torque, are smaller than six, five or six transistor or even more SRAM devices. And so you can get a lot more of this memory, which is non-volatile, um, on a, a, a particular die size, and that doesn't have the leakage uh, that you'd have with SRAM. Um, NOR flash scaling, um, a lot of it seems to be around 20 to 28 nanometer, but there's been some work that indicates they might be able to shrink down to 15, but it's uh, difficult to see it going bit lower than that. And so we see that that's uh, S, uh, NOR flash replacement for some of these applications is a strong area. Um, and so NOR, uh, SRAM and NOR, some of the uh, more immediate applications, lower power, uh, lower cost and higher density as a consequence here, and there's some uh, figures over there on the uh, lower right-hand side. Things I can't see the red uh, that, give, <laughs> that show some of the advantages, both in terms of, especially in terms of the real estate uh, and the power uh, that you get with MRAM compared to uh, compared to SRAM. Um, so as said before, the, all the foundries uh, have basically uh, are getting MRAM equipment and including that as an option, uh, Samsung, TSMC, Global Foundries, UMC, all have, uh, you know, worked out uh, IP deals with various companies, for instance, Global Foundries with Everspin, it's actually a, a few years old at this point. Um, uh, also Avalanche has some of these as well. Um, right now, a lot of the process uh, has been back end of line. In other words, you've got a CMOS wafer with all the logic on it, and now I build my uh, MRAM on top of that. But in order to cost reduce, there's two things that are going to be important factors which will make this even, which will help to propagate this. One is just more volume, more manufacturing, more improvement yield as a consequence. The other thing is going from back end of line and doing more incorporation within this, uh, closer to the CMOS process itself. So we see a, uh, some capital equipment. Uh, and developments going on in there, and that's going to uh, drive the need of new tools as the volume goes up and uh, more capital spending, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. So another one of these technologies, uh, so we covered phase change, we covered magnetic, uh, magnetic uh, random access memory. 
uh, is resistive uh, random access memory. And there's a lot of these technologies, including MRAM and phase change for that matter, that are essentially resistive technologies. The memory state is a low, high resistance state, you know, with whatever physical technology is going on there. But there's a particular class of devices uh, that we refer to as, uh, as resistive RAM. Um, and there's a, basically they have a top electrode, a bottom electrode, and something happening in between them that changes the resistance. And that could be um, uh, f formation of some ionic states that you can, uh, you know, by uh, putting a charge on, on the, uh, 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 the bottom or top electrode, between the a voltage between the bottom and top electrode, you can change the, uh, uh, the oxide, uh, the ionic state formation. It could also be little metal filaments that can be caused to form and, 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 uh, and uh, un unform, uh, which can change the resistance between those two electrodes. As I mentioned before, phase change memory essentially is also resistive memory. Um, so is MRAM, um, effectively. Um, Memristor is a technology that was developed by HP that was a, uh, that was a resistive uh, uh, RAM pro uh, technology. And actually, it's become, for some people, sort of a generic term for resistive RAM. They call them memristors, even though they may not be the original idea that, uh, that HP developed. And then carbon nanotube technology is another one. I think there's going to be a talk tomorrow, actually, on that yeah. by Bill Gervaisi. Um, is another uh, generally used as a resistive technology. Um, so they all use a, a, a two resistance state to represent ones and zeros. Um, so there's two types that are in the lead. Uh, one is uh, based on SiO2, and the reason why is because it's uh, fairly compatible with, uh, I mean, it's basically compatible with the uh, existing CMOS process, crossbar, wee bit nano, or some of the uh, pioneers in that area. They're positioned as a memory. Also, it's being positioned as a memory for neural networks. Now, this is actually an analog computing device that that's, uh, uh, emulates the way our brains work, but it's able to accumulate weighting functions that can be used then for artificial intelligence training applications. Uh, Crossbars ha actually has production at SMIC, so there's some, some of these uh, foundry outfits that are working also on resistive RAM as a possibility. But resistive RAM is not yet in, in significant volume, although there are companies who have been shipping stuff uh, for years. Uh, the metal filament, um, there's a company called Adesto that has been actually in volume production, limited volume production for quite some time on this. And uh, there's specialized applications where this resistive RAM has come into use. The other important technology we want to talk to you about today um, is uh, ferroelectric random access memory. And I guess if I click this, yeah, the, the atom bounces around. So basically uh, what this is, it's uh, creating electrical polarization um, and there's two polarization states, and those, again, can represent uh, a memory technology. Um, so the status now, there's a company called Ramtron, which is now part of Cyprus, a formula called Ramtron, which is now part of Cyprus. It's basically the only supplier of uh, uh, ferroelectric random access memory devices, and they're using a material called uh, lead zirconium titanate, which actually has been in production for some time. And there's some applications like uh, radiation-hard environments, high magnetic field environments and stuff where these technologies have some use. Um, there's other, other interesting renditions as well. There's actually thin film, plastic, flexible materials that can have ferroelectric uh, memory properties. And so people talk about building those into you know, wearable devices or things that go on your skin or stuff like that. Um, and then there's also uh, the Symmetrics IP provider. Um, an interesting uh, technology here is uh, the use of hafnium oxide. So hafnium oxide is used in a lot of semiconductor processes. But there's a special phase of hafnium oxide that was discovered a few years ago has very strong ferroelectric properties. Um, there is actually a startup company, uh, uh, NAM Lab from Dresden in Germany, uh, which is uh, working to try to make uh, functional memories with this. Uh, you know, and again, hafnium oxide is, is used in a lot of these processes. So again, it's one of these materials people are uh, fairly comfortable with. There are current markets today where people are doing some FRAM devices, uh, RFID, you know, for identifying cheap identify uh, materials, uh, uh, wireless identification materials, and other low right current applications. Um, so all these memories share one at some attributes. Well, first of all, all these memories we're looking at are non-volatile. In other words, they, when you put the memory on there, when you, put a mem you write the memory, it stays written for a while. But they're all small single element cells. They support inexpensive, uh, small or inexpensive die, and, and some of them support 3D stacking. Uh, they promise a scale past DRAM and NAND technology. In other words, they, they, it looks like they can shrink to smaller lithographic features if we need that. Uh, they offer write-in-place 
um, so you don't have to do block erases, and you can get more symmetrical read-write speeds, for instance, than NAND flash, where the write speed is considerably slower than the, uh, than the read speed. And the, the resistive RAM is, if NAND flash would stay still for a while, resistive RAM keeps having, you know, people talk about that potentially replacing uh, NAND flash. Um, uh, they can all be used as a persistent memory as the definitions are developing. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of this table oh, here. Have them memorize it. You should memorize. We'll have a test on this later. Um, <laughs> but here, here's a, a, a number of these attributes here, and the low. And if you're in the back of the room, you really can't read this. So you can look at the present. Look at it. Download it. Look at this. Yeah, the slides are all downloadable. Yeah, but uh, on the uh, uh, the left hand side of the table here, we uh, we're talking about some of the conventional uh, uh, memory technologies: SRAM, DRAM, uh, NOR flash, and NAND flash. And then we get into some of the uh, uh, currently shipping uh, or soon to be shipping products potentially, uh, which is a toggle MRAM, the spin uh, torque MRAM, uh, ferroelectric memory, I can't, there phase it is, change. Uh, phase change memory, and, and resistive RAM. I just can't see the red, that's the problem. And so we're showing a bunch of different characteristics uh, that when you get a chance to actually read this thing, you can see uh, um, that some of these are actually getting fairly close to some of the, some of these new memories are getting fairly close in, in many of their characteristics. Um, higher endurance, higher uh, write read speeds than uh, some of the conventional memories. So there is, uh, we, you know, we believe that there will be an increasing movement from the use of, over time, from the use of volatile memories to more and more of the non-volatile memories. And that's part of that whole embedded, uh, uh, sort of embedded hierarchical scheme that we see developing. So if we compare now some of these technologies in terms of bandwidth and cell size, cell size refers to how big the individual memory cells are. And they oftentimes give that as F squared. Uh, so that's the, uh, uh, the horizontal axis, the cell size, uh, the bandwidth megabytes per second is on the vertical axis. SRAM is over there. It's very large, right? Uh, it's over on the upper right-hand side. It's very large, but very fast. Um, and you can see that uh, we've got these various memory technologies talked about. By the way, NRAM is the, uh, uh, that's the uh, carbon nanotube technology there. Um, and you can see DRAM on there. You can see phase change memory that fits in. It's fairly small cell size. It's, it's reasonable bandwidth. It's not as, as, as high as, say, SRAM. You can see the spin tunnel torque on there, uh, the toggle MRAM. Um, the spin orbit uh, MRAM, our best estimate where that fit, we put, that's a new add onto this chart that, we, that we've got here uh, that it could have, we believe, performance that approaches that of SRAM, but at a smaller size, and hence the advantage. So this just gives you a look at some of these technologies, and with that, I hand it to okay, Jim. Thanks. I, 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 you know, there, there is a similarity between this chart and that one that I took a long time explaining to you too, with all the orbs in a line, right. is that it's cost on the bottom and it's bandwidth on the vertical axis, and uh, you know, then the question is, wh whether or not these things will end up fitting into your normal memory storage hierarchy, and we'll find that out. We'll talk about that in ten years, and you all be joking and saying it wasn't obvious then, but it's really obvious now. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So why use bandwidth as opposed to latency? Yeah, that's another important one. Then it'd have to be a three D chart and it'd be harder to read it. Yeah. <laughs> for for yeah, but the the latency for NAND flash would make the thing really, really awful. <laughs> because because of the fact that it takes a long time to set up and then once it's set up, then it shoots a whole bunch of data at you very quickly. Did we have latency on the table? I think we did, didn't we? Uh, I think so, yeah. I yeah. Think so if you look at the table, I think, uh, let's see where it's in there. Uh, oh, it's byte read time, byte write time. There we go, okay. Yeah, yeah. the very yeah. top. So that's latency, yeah. basically. Yeah, but yeah, it's, you know, we could have put some one of these other things onto this chart instead, and we just chose bandwidth. But like uh, NOR flash is way up there. It's uh, 5 million compared to, uh, you know, yeah. SRAM at 2, for example. Yeah, but if you want to pay us, we'll make one that's got latency on there. <laughs> <laughs> so let me talk about support for emerging memories. Oh, he's leaving. Yeah, he's <laughs> I drove him out. <laughs> oh, you mentioned money, Jim. That did it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's getting his checkbook. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 you know, let's talk a little bit about the support requirements for these things because, um, you know, and that's, that's what you guys are here for is that there, there are things that are going on in the industry to support these uh, new technologies because they don't just automatically fit in to the computing architecture. 
and hardware, Jetic and others are uh, doing things to support early development. And Bill Gervasi, the guy who's going to be talking from uh, uh, Mantero tomorrow that we talked about before, the carbon nanotube guy, he's actually going to be talking more about Jetic and what it's doing. Um, you know, and they're just looking at what the ongoing requirements are going to be and whether or not they can get these things in place in time. SNEA has naturally done a really good job of operating system support and is now migrating over to more uh, of the application program support, but also support of different environments like the RDMA, RDMA uh, and persistent memory over fabrics architectures. Which we just heard about before this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, there's also support going on in the EDA community. These are the people who help mm -hmm. people design chips that go into the foundries, like that chip that uh, Tom showed the diagram of. The early development for hardware is being supported by NVDMN, and that's something that's been a subject uh, at a number of STCCs in the past. Uh, it's probably five years now that it's been there. And it's made, it's a DRAM with flash backup. Um, this is something that is being used for development of persistent memory software, and whether or not it has a life after that remains to be determined. But, you know, there's certainly been a lot of interest at the hyperscalers for NVDMNs. The trouble with it is on that first chart with all the orbs in a line, NVDMN ends up being significantly more expensive than DRAM, but is the same speed. And please pray for the people in the next room. <laughs> <laughs> They're having trouble. OK, so uh, you know, and you need to have BIOS changes because all of a sudden you need to have the opportunity for the BIOS not to completely overwrite the data that's in the DRAM every time that there's a power failure. And there's another thing that's uh, difficulty is you know, whenever a lot of systems fail, then people will turn the power off and turn it back on again. With persistent memory, if your BIOS tells you that what's in the memory is valid, then it's just going to fail again every time you turn it on. So there ha people, people think through all of these things about how to fix it. Um, but uh, you know, there's also a power fail signal that the memory, the DIM, has to recognize. It has to be told, hey, it's time to move that data out of the DRAM into the uh, NAND flash. So all of these things had to be thought out and standardized. And 3D Crosspoint is driving an awful lot of these changes. Um, the design tools, this is more for people who are designing their own chips using the new foundry processes where you've got an IoT chip. It's going to have, it would have normally had SRAM and NORFLASH inside, and now you're replacing it with MRAM. Well, your design tools have to be able to cope with that. And so, you know, there, there is support from Synopsys starting in, uh, it started in Q2 of this year, and Cadence is also going to be putting it together for uh, DDR4 controllers. And then I just had to mention a report that's on NVDIMS. It's now available. So <laughs> I'm, I'm here because people like you buy reports, and I make money off of them, I hope. <laughs> Money's good. Yes. So All right, thank you, Jeff. Give it back to Tom. OK, so uh, oh, that was the next one. Ah, so speaking of one of our favorite uh, groups, SNEA, uh, they've had this uh, wonderful uh, uh, non-volatile memory programming uh, group, and uh, so um, and I actually had a talk uh, that was referring to, the, uh, a couple of talks referring to this uh, earlier today. Um, but uh, uh, what's, uh, basically this, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, creating software that will enable uh, SSDs, you know, uh, flash memory devices, but also uh, can enable Optane, can enable uh, future uh, emerging memory technologies as well. The idea is to be able to get faster access to data, which is partly going to be a matter of the interface, it's partly going to be a matter of the software not getting in the way. And so a lot of those issues in terms of the software layers that would get in the way of the performance of the actual device, that's what this group has been attacking. Um, it, uh, so they've created the models uh, and, and the definitions and standards based on, uh, or proposed standards based on that that would allow both a, a block file um, and potentially direct access to memory where that makes appropriate, which again fits into the talks that we had earlier today. I made a mistake in this slide. Did it you? Said, yeah, it said SNEA's persistent memory programming model. It's actually called the non-volatile memory programming model. It is. That's model. why I called it that. <laughs> Even though you, yeah, I spoke Thanks. around that. Yeah. Um, so um, software applications uh, program support. Uh, so persistent memory or non-volatile memory is useless if its advantage is untapped. In other words, if you can't access the performance, you know, you're paying more and, getting le and not getting what you're paying for. So. Um, we need to be able to build uh, or build the idea around persistence where that where that makes sense, which is on that uh, 
you know, where you direct access to memory. Uh, change, uh, changes will take some time to implement, fully implement all these software uh, requirements, uh, but the work is going on that. Um, people that build their own, of course, they can do this like hyperscale data centers, that sort of thing. But uh, you know, for commercial software, uh, we're waiting for demand uh, from you folks that are customers out there to say, I want this now, uh, to get those folks, uh, you know, to get that fully implemented. And, oh, did I skip you? Yep, I did, sorry. Maybe we can talk about this later, but I think there's some people who strongly disagree with that. Okay. Yeah, ginormous ah, okay. memory. Yes. So, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Ginormous memory. Ginormous memory. Yeah. Memory database or something like that. Sure. And sure. No software changes needed at all. Oh, that's true too. Yeah. I mean, but you want to, if you want to use uh, all the capabilities. Sure. Yes. Then, yeah. If you want to fully equate, you're right. If yeah. You want, that your first line there is is just sort of not true. Okay. Well, it's well. not. It's persistent memory is useless, but it's not Optane is useless. The deal is, is that Optane gives you huge dims. And yeah. yeah, there's. Yeah. Optane isn't the only one there. Yeah, yeah. But, but the one that's got the huge modules right now is but, Optane. Yeah, sorry, I'm not trying to jump yeah. into your presentation. Yeah, that's fine. There are yeah. people who would not agree with that. And you, having, out, out. And we have a recommendation <laughs> from at least somebody here that, that kind of covers that area of the advantage you yeah. can use. So. Okay. All right, we stand. Is, is we'll there sta somebody who's talking about the two different modes, the uh, uh, memory mode and the apps direct mode yeah. at the right. thing? So. Because one of my favorite things to say is that Optane DIMMs, which Intel calls um, Intel Optane DC persistent memory, yeah. is not persistent when it's used in memory mode. Got that? <laughs> okay, so moving right along. <laughs> what are some of the things that are going to get in the way? Um, well, the, first of all, this is a very old thing. I put together this over 10 years ago, and it's supposed to show why people have been spending so much money for the past three or four decades trying to get persistent memory or you know, new, what, are, what we call emerging memory technologies to work. And so here you've got a log scale of what the cost is per bit. And it's a relative cost. It's, it's, this isn't an absolute kind of a thing. And then down below here are the processes, process geometries that are used to manufacture the product. And so it goes from 500 nanometers, the big things on this side, the small things on that side. And this was just showing what's likely to happen in the future. This model assumes that a flash wafer costs a certain amount. And as you shrink the process geometry, then the price of the flash goes down to a certain point. And then flash reaches what's called its scaling limit, which was 15 nanometers for NAND flash. And at that time, 10 years ago, then people were saying, well, yeah, you know, it's going to hit its scaling limit. Nobody's going to be able to drive the costs out of it anymore, and so its costs are going to level off. Now, the black line was for what a new memory could do, and the new memory had a more expensive wafer than the existing memory. I think it's two times for this model. And um, it ended up that as long as the new memory could scale past that 15 nanometer number for NAND flash, then it was set up that a couple of process generations later on, its cost would go below NAND flashes. And the market would just flip from using all NAND flash and none of the new memory to using all new memory and no NAND flash. Now, the NAND guys threw a curveball at this by going to 3D. But uh, you know this is something that still has some value for NOR flash and for SRAM. And so those are the technologies that are likely to be taken over at smaller process geometries by some of these new technologies. Um, so what dictates the cost of memory? Well, as we saw on that chart, scale, the, what the bottom access was, is one of them. But also the wafer cost, which was what made the red line and the black line on that chart different from each other. And the megabytes per wafer are, you know, according to scale, how, how small you can make the transistors. The smaller you make the transistors, the more megabytes you get on a wafer. And then yield is something that people don't talk about, but it's, you know, how, how successfully can you make it? Um, and so the megabytes per wafer are driven by the size of the bits. Shrinking bits allow cost reductions. And so that's why they do all of the process shrinks. That's just Moore's law. But the two big things are driven by scale. And that is the wafer cost and the yield. Is When I say driven by scale, that's like how many wafers do you make? If you make one wafer ever of something, 
you're probably going to have a miserable yield and you're going to have a huge wafer cost. If you make hundreds of millions of wafers of something, you're going to have a really low wafer cost and really high yield. Or your boss is going to get on your case. Yeah. Actually, DRAM and NAND flash are built in the tens of millions of wafers per year. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of a scale that we're talking about. None of these other technologies are there. And you've got a kind of a chicken and egg problem that I'm going to go into. So, so this is what happened with NAND flash. And this is the solid lines are actual data from a scorekeeper of the semiconductor industry called the World Semiconductor Trade Statistics, WSTS. They've been doing this since the 1970s and actually giving monthly data. So this is data derived from that showing what the price per gigabyte on the market was for NAND flash and for DRAM. It uses a log vertical scale because if I didn't, then it would come really steeply down and then hug the bottom. But instead, you've got these, these guys you know, on a log scale showing up you know, nicely there. And the dotted line is just my extrapolation of what happened in NAND flash before WSTS was tracking it in that kind of resolution. But what's important is that in 2004, right when SSDs started becoming popular, that was when NAND flash started getting cheaper than DRAM. NAND was slower than DRAM, and once it got cheaper than DRAM, then it fit into that storage hierarchy, that orb chart that I showed you early on. So what happened to allow that to happen is that NAND flash's gigabyte shipment, which is again on a log scale so that you can read it, um, NAND flash gigabyte shipments grew to close to DRAM. So if you look at the 2004 right here, then you can see that they're not the same, but they're within the same order of magnitude as each other. NAND flash uh, bits got to be about a third as large as DRAM bits. And once the two of them got to that kind of a relationship, then the pricing got close. Not just because of the fact that they were close to each other, but also the die size of a NAND flash chip with a certain number of bits on it on the same process is half as large as the die size for a DRAM chip using the same process and the same number of bits. And so, so NAND, there was always this view that NAND could get cheaper than DRAM, but it didn't happen until the volume got up to this 2004 level of within an order of magnitude of DRAM. That same thing has to happen with Optane for it to be cost effective for Intel to make. The same thing has to happen to any of these memories uh, with relationship to other memories in order for them to be able to take over. But it is happening and more of these things are shipping. So, you know, new memory technologies can't have a price advantage unless they're running at a similar volume. And so this is the way that we expect to see this go. And this is in Tom's and my report. You know, it goes out to 2030 down here in the corner. And so this is price per gigabyte, once again, a log curve. And a bunch of old technologies, E squared PROM, SRAM, NOR flash, DRAM, and NAND flash. You know, these have been around for a long time. We're expecting for DRAM to uh, hit a scaling limit at some point, probably about 2025. I think uh, my battery's dying on this thing. But, on a red but anyway, you see the knee and the curve here is, you know, that's, that's from DRAM stopping scaling, which is probably going to happen, you know, five or 10 years from now. NAND flash should continue to go down, but this new memory, we're already seeing MRAM going below SRAM and even NOR flash pricing today. And we're expecting at some point that it should be able to cross over DRAM probably around 2025, 2030. And so a lot of things are going to change over the next decade or so. Oh, here, sorry. Technologies are shrinking markets, EEPROM, SRAM, and NORFLASH, and all of their markets are shrinking. They're not going to be migrating to advanced processes. That's why they're straight lines. Mm -hmm. Um, process leaders, DRAM and NAND flash, are cost reducing following Moore's law as long as they can. Mm -hmm. And the new memory is actually going to be moving faster than Moore's law because it's going to be using processes that, that are not expensive processes to get developed on and eventually move into these newer processes that are more advanced. And so we have the MRAM, SRAM crossover, uh, MRAM NOR crossover in 2019. And then once DRAM stops scaling, then we see the new memory crossing over maybe two generations later. And so our outlook for this is that we don't think that anything works in a vacuum, that all of these different memories work against each other and with each other. And persistent memory is part of that greater ecosystem. 
Um, one thing to keep in mind is that prices do swing around an awful lot in memories, and we've seen a lot of that last year with DRAM prices going way high while NAND flash prices were falling, and now this year with DRAM prices collapsing and NAND flash prices kind of leveling off. But we expect to see foundry processes be a really big place for this. Um, so let's talk a little bit about those price swings. This is what's called the commodity price cycle, and I got a warning. I couldn't see what the warning was. Was it five minutes? Uh, let's see. I think we got ten minutes. Okay, fine. So, so you know, this is just the economics, and you know, so I won't bore you guys too much with it. But what happens with anything, farming, steel, semiconductors, is that when people have a shortage, they're profitable. They invest in more capacity. They overinvest. That drives out the profits because all of a sudden there's too much capacity, and so they stop investing, and then that drives a shortage, and it just keeps going around and around and around. Anybody who tells you the semiconductor cycle is dead, tell them no, because it's you know memories are commodity, and they're going to continue to do that. The status of today's cycle is that we predicted a collapse. It happened. Um, you know, to us it's boring. Everybody else is running around like you know everything's new and scary. Um, it's a, an overcapacity driven by supply. Don't believe anything that anybody tells you about it being demand driven, which a lot of people are saying. 3D NAND is selling close to cost. DRAM still has room to fall. We're expecting the prices to fall until it sells at cost. And so we're not expecting to see any change until demand catches up with supply, which it always does. It usually takes about two years. But two years after 2019 is 2021. And that's when we're expecting to see China become very important in the memory market. And so it could be that this down cycle is going to last longer than any in the history of the semiconductor market. Aren't you glad you're not with semi? Well, don't, I hope not any of you are with semiconductor manufacturers. So what's the impact to persistent memory? It competes against established technologies. So 3D crosspoint, once again, has to be cheaper than DRAM. And a DRAM collapse created the crosspoint price down that we're seeing today even though Crosspoint is sole sourced. So this is kind of a funny predicament that you've got a sole source product that should be immune to price swings that unfortunately has to be priced below DRAM. And so it's, it's being hit by those. This is a really vague chart that we use to try to say, eh, kind of, this is where things are going to go. So we've got these five-year intervals spelled out across the bottom. And we say logic, what we mean is the embedded memory inside these IoT chips that Tom talked about. That's going to undergo a very slow transition. Some people say it's going to transition over to resist resistive RAM. Some people say it's going to transition over to MRAM, maybe even both, although it's more economical just to have one of those win out. But it's really too early for us to tell what's going to happen. NAND flash and DRAM, on the other hand, are likely to undergo really fast transitions once the market transitions over. And so we look at NAND and we say, how many layers can you build? We don't know. We just heard you know, a few weeks ago that now Samsung's talking about 800 layers in a NAND flash. If I hear 1,000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so so you know, it could be that we need to push that NAND flash thing out to 2020, 2030 or something like that. But at some point, they're probably going to run out of the ability to continue to double the number of layers every two years, which is the rate that they've been running at. And when that happens, then it will open the door for a new technology to come in. And I don't know, could be re-RAM. That was what people have been talking about as a replacement for NAND flash. Um, DRAM, and, and I noticed, too, we, we use re-RAM and we use R-RAMs in some of the slides. You we know? do. They, they both mean the same thing. It's just, you know, it's just which do you rather say? All means resistive RAM. Um, DRAM probably is going to go a little bit longer because there are still new materials and things that can be used to make DRAMs even smaller. And so it's probably going to slow down a good bit, but you know, at some point it's going to open itself up to be replaced. And AMRAM is the thing that people have been talking about as being the candidate for that. Um, you know, come back to me in 2030, ask me what I think about this slide. I'll probably turn all red in the face. <laughs> Oh, and I'm sorry, I was supposed to give it over to you. That's right. And after Jim's um, optimistic uh, market projections, <laughs> um, I'm going to close out here. Talk to you a little bit, uh, getting back to our report. Um, so here's our projections of uh, actually petabyte shipments in a log scale there on the uh, left-hand axis. And then uh, per year, uh, showing uh, uh, we got MRAM, we got DRAM, uh, 3D Crosspoint, and also NAND there. So and we point out particular in large, friendly letters so you could see them. Um, our projections on 3D crosspoint, again, remember that's a log scale, 
um, and also MRAM. So uh, uh, embedded uh, MRAM, see, we see replacing a lot of uh, uh, system on chip, embedded type applications, NOR and SRAM, as Jim indicated, potentially down the road could also have some impact on DRAM. Um, there's a strong appeal in AI applications, especially if they've got a lot of uh, waiting function they need to store into uh, in, the, in the device. Um, now, uh, based upon that, uh, upon that, uh, upon the uh, growth and the, the shipped memory, there also will be uh, uh, new production volumes that are required. Again, we're looking at moving from back end of line, further into the line, uh, moving from a domination by discrete devices into embedded embedded applications. Um, and so, here's our projections on the on the capital spending to make to make this. And we're looking at a, a baseline uh, market that could be like 800. Uh, million dollars of equipment uh, to make that MRAM that we required earlier, or it could be higher, it could be over bill, well over a billion dollars. And then finally, just uh, to close things out, of course, we're going to advertise our report here. Yeah, you which guys is, had enough advertisements? Yeah, the emerging, uh, <laughs> our emerging memory report uh, that, uh, that we're away from the long and winding road, which is the last report, and it's turned into a ramp. Um, and so it looks uh, in depth, greater depth than these things, and you can see all, all the assumptions except that we're making on this and looking at embedded emerging memories and discrete memories with 172 pages, three tables, and 125 figures can be yours. <laughs> so with that, uh, just a quick summary. Uh, we think that uh, emerging memories are uh, more than a, uh, are, are, are getting off, slowly getting off the long and winding road and starting to actually ramp in real applications. Uh, there's major uh, commitments for server and embedded applications, and actually uh, even some uh, interesting computing applications uh, with these, uh, some of these uh, 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 neuromorphic computing applications with resistive RAM or phase jam in particular. Um, it's still hard to determine the front runner for some of these applications, so that's, uh, uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, support requirements are being pretty well addressed. There seems to be a good ecosystem to manufacture these things. Now the question is, Again, doing the ramp, as, as uh, Jim pointed out. The new memories will drive additional capital spending in this industry. Um, we'll end up with a greater bestiary of storage and memory options because old things don't go away. We just accumulate more barnacles um, on the memory storage hierarchy uh, to do more things and give us more powers. Um, so, but many uh, issues confront the market. Uh, Jim went into some of the interesting economics of how this stuff works. And uh, with that, we're open to some additional questions if you guys have them. Barnacles, huh? Barnacles, you like that? <laughs> Barnacles on the hierarchy. I'll just put it down there. Thank you. Nathan's yes, got Nathan's got one. Bigger fins, perhaps? Whatever. <laughs> what are the physical constraints that you think are going to be insurmountable that are going to cause DRAM to stop scaling? The, the thing that, that has caused DRAM trouble in the past is the size of the capacitor. And um, if a DRAM bit is basically a capacitor that holds a charge, it represents the bit, and that charge decays, and so that's why it needs to be refreshed, and a transistor to allow the rest of the circuitry to either read that capacitor's voltage or to pump current back into the capacitor mm -hmm. and charge it up. And uh, so the capacitor, they went from having a flat capacitor to having what they call the trench cell, and then they had the deep trench where they got to aspect ratios of about 40 to 1, and they said, oh, wow, you know, that's really hard, but we did it. And meanwhile, 3D NAND has gone to 60 to 1 and bigger aspect ratios, and so DRAM is going to be able to take advantage of that technology. But then the, a couple of things dictate how much uh, the capacitor you can put in how small of a volume. And one is uh, the, the size of the plates of the capacitor, and the other is the dielectric constant. And there are materials that have not been used for DRAM that have um, dielectric constants that are orders of magnitude larger than what's being used right now, or maybe an order of magnitude larger. 
Um, but they're not very nice things to put into a semiconductor fab. They exude contaminants out the wazoo. So, oh, worse than copper. But copper did teach the industry how to quarantine things. And so, you know, it, it, it got a valuable lesson. I'm expecting for a lot of avenues like that to uh, go on. That we'll have deeper trenches, we'll have, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have weirder materials that go into it, and eventually the DRAM will run out of all of those and finally need to be replaced with something. And Jim, I think that's the end. I think um, uh, these nice people would like to go have some adult beverages, so we should probably let it go. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming. Well, Nathan didn't get a second question. Yeah.